Hey, so uh, IB psychology students, you have to be able to answer this question, how emotion affects cognition. So this is what I'm going to explain in this video. And like all my videos, I'm going to try and give you a couple of key points that most students miss, but are going to help you separate your answers from the rest. So how we're going to answer this question is by looking at flashbulb memory theory. And most IB psychology students use this theory when looking at the effects of emotion on cognition. So what do you need to know in order to really explain flashbulb memory theory? First, you need to get the definition right. Then you need to explain why they're formed. And this is a key point that a lot of students miss. Then we'll look at some evidence, the studies that support it, and then also limitations. So first of all, let's start with definitions. This is one of the most commonly misdefined terms in psychology. Uh, and it's, it's if you get the definition wrong in the beginning of your answer, um, it, it's going to set you off on the wrong foot with the examiner, so get it right. The flashbulb memory is not a memory of an event. It's the memory of the circumstances of hearing the news of a surprising event. Right? And that's a really key distinction. Okay, So according to Brown and Kulik's original 1977 theory, it's the memory of circumstances of hearing the news of a surprising or emotional event. So for example, um, if you're in, you're in high school or, or you're in college, you might have um, been accepted already to a university, the flashbulb memory theory, uh, the flashbulb memory would be where you were when you found out you got accepted, or maybe you got a rejection letter, right? What were you doing at that time? What were the circumstances around you? Um, have you ever been dumped via text? Uh, the flashbulb memory theory would, the flashbulb memory, sorry, would be where you were when that happened, right? Where you were when you got the text, who was around you, how did you feel? That's another example. Um, September 11th at the attacks. Now you're um, probably too young to remember these, but uh, this is uh, another really common flashbulb memory. So it wouldn't if it, flashbulb memory wouldn't be those people uh, in the towers at the time uh, or, or near the towers seeing it happen. It would be like me. I was in high school an hour and a half away and saw it on the TV and saw it later in the day um, and heard about it on the radio. Those circumstances of hearing about what was going on, that's the flashbulb memory. Princess Diana um, dying in her car crash um, many years ago, uh, about 20 years ago, is, again, the flashbulb memory of hearing about that happening, right? So first key, get the definition right. Other common flashbulb memories you might want to ask your parents or your grandparents, um, uh, uh, JFK, Martin Luther King. And a good way to think about flashbulb um, memory and flashbulb memories is to draw to your own personal experience. So think about really vivid memories you have of when you heard um, really emotional news and also talk to your parents and grandparents and see what flashbulb memories they have. Um, now, this is something that m I think nearly every answer is, is going to miss out and if you can include these, it's going to really show you understand flashbulb memory. Flashbulb, according to the original theory, um, flashbulb memories include these things. The place, the informant, the event, the effect, and the aftermath. So what do these mean? The place is where you were when uh, you heard the, the news, right? The informant is how did you hear it? Who told you or what was the source, right? If it was on the news or the TV. The event was what you were doing at the time and effect uh, is when we refer to emotion. So the two things here, the emotion you were feeling and the emotion uh, of others around you. Now remember, we're not just looking at negative emotion. This could also be really positive news. But I still remember where I was when my brother announced that um, he was pregnant with his second kid, right? A really positive thing. I can still see who was around me, how I felt, um, where he was, even where he was standing when he told us the news. So affect emotion can be positive as well as, as negative. And the aftermath, so what were the consequences? So uh, again, when you're summarizing flashbulb memory theory, I think um, including these factors can be a really good way to show that you know the theory and you understand what a flashbulb memory is. Now we get into the explanation. How does the emotion affect the cognition? So the cognition we're looking at here, of course, is the flashbulb memory. But why do they form? And according to the theory, two reasons. One, they're surprising, and two, they're emotional. These are the two factors that lead to the formation of flashbulb memory. And here, so here we can see that the, the emotion is the, the, one of the key factors that's causing the cognition, the flashbulb memory. But why? Why does surprising emotion cause a flashbulb memory and this is a detail that many students miss and if you can include this in your answer you're going to separate yours from the rest the key is rehearsal if something's surprising in emotion it's going to increase the amount you rehearse uh, the details of what you remember about where you were when you found out about that emotional memory and rehearsal we now know um, you know through years of research that the, the more rehearsal you have 
the stronger the memory trace, the stronger the memory is uh, in your brain. And so there are two ways that we rehearse information, overtly and covertly. So the more surprising the emotional um, the event is, the more that we're going to rehearse the information. So overt rehearsal refers to talking to others, right? You find out something, um, and then you're talking about the next day, like, oh man, did you hear about that? Yeah, wow, well, yeah, I was, I was watching TV with my mom, and then it came on the news, right? So you're going to be talking about it with other people, and you're going to be sharing that. That's one way that people rehearse the information and strengthen the memory of the flashbulb. Um, memory and the other way is covertly okay so overt is open covert is closed quietly so you'd be just thinking about it internally to yourself so the other the two ways in which we rehearse the information because it's really um, emotional and surprising so we're going to rehearse about it uh, one other key claim uh, of the uh, theory was that there's a neurophysiological link right there's, there's something in our brain that's facilitating this flashbulb memory formation um, and so, yeah, they're associated with these processes. But in 1977, we didn't have the brain imaging technology we had now. And in the original uh, report, it's they're, they're pretty vague, and they even the um, Brownie Kulik uh, admit there's not a lot of evidence. But this is more like a hypothesis, All right? So they're hypo hypothesizing that this was the factor. But this is a key claim of the original theory, if you are summarizing um, FBM theory. And uh, so, and the one final claim, and we're going to look at this uh, later when we look at the evidence, is that that flashbulb memories are more vivid and accurate than just regular memories, right? So they are a different type of memory altogether, according to the theory. So to summary, uh, summarize, if you are explaining flashbulb memory and how it explains how emotion affects cognition, you need to include these things. Get the definition right. Um, what are the key factors, right? The place, the informant, the emotion, etc. Clearly explain why they're formed, right? Because a surprising emotion leads to a rehearsal and rehearsal is going to increase the memory. Add the, the neurophysiological claim of the theory and also the final claim about them being more vivid and lasting longer. That's going to give you a very detailed summary of flashbulb memory theory that really shows you understand it. Now we get to the um, the evidence, right? Where are the supporting studies for this? So I, I think the most important one, I would say the one you should use, um, is Brownie Kulik's original study. So in, when they originally proposed their theory, they included in it this study that they conducted. So they were comparing black Americans and white Americans, right? This is in the late 1970s. And they asked them about 10 flashbulb memories. Most of them were about assassinations of public figures. So JFK and Martin Luther King were two of those public figures. And one was about a personal event. And what they did was they, they compared um, the flashbulb memory formation, who had more flashbulb memories for which type of event. And what they found was white people had more flashbulb memories for JFK. A lot of black people did too, but it was more whites. But a bigger difference was for um, black people having more flashbulb memories for Martin Luther King. Right, so they are the results. And don't make the mistake of finishing with your results when you're, when you're adding these in your answers. Explain why. Explain the results. What's the conclusion? How does this address the question? And so if we're looking at the effects of emotion on cognition, we have to think, how do we use that to explain this? Well, Martin Luther King was a very instrumental figure for black Americans. He was the leader of the civil rights movement, and he was very important in, in making changes to make the lives of black Americans better. His death had a really high emotional significance for black people, more so than white people. So the increased emotion for black people with Martin Luther King's death is going to increase the rehearsal. This is consistent with the theory, right? Well, this is how the theory, sorry, would explain the results of the study. That that higher emotion because of his death is going to increase the rehearsal, which is going to increase the flashbulb memory formation. So that's one piece of a supporting evidence. We also now, after brain imaging technology, we have a lot of neurological evidence. So we know that the amygdala, which is a little shape there in the, um, all right, this little guy here, the amygdala, we know this is instrumental in um, forming emotional memories, right? So when emotions happen, this activates and um, com communicates with the hippocampus, which is going to help uh, create the uh, any memory about emotion. So we do know that there's some neurological evidence, but you know, is this flashbulb memory specific or is this just any type of emotional memory? That's that's an important counterclaim to that piece of evidence. So uh, one other thing we, we look at with when we're looking at theories is what are the applications? So if we're evaluating a theory like flashbulb memory theory, you have to think, okay, well, how can this be used? And I'm going to provide just a hypothesis here. Um, this is just my own thinking, but perhaps that uh, it, it could help us understand PTSD symptoms because one of the key symptoms of PTSD is memory. We tend to remember, um, uh, we tend to hold on to the memories of the traumatic event that have been experienced. Uh, and this could lead to intrusive memories, so memories that you don't really want, but you can't control thinking about them and also having flashbacks. 
And so if we understand the origins of these, you know, unwanted flashbacks and memories, then maybe we can apply this to help our treatment. So if we understand why that these memories might form because of the rehearsal, the emotion of the trauma is going to increase the rehearsal that we have, um, then maybe we can uh, work towards developing treatment so people will change how they think, change how they rehearse that information or think about it less, think about it in different ways. And that could be one possible application of, of knowing about um, the effects of emotion on um, memory. There's also uh, counterclaims. There's also some evidence that challenges the the idea that flashbulb memories are more vivid and, and last longer. And let's just look at one. So in Britain, forty five percent of people studied remember seeing the video. Right, forty five percent. That's quite a high number. But there's just one problem. There is no video. Right, there's no film of of, of the car crash. Uh, and so you know, how can they remember seeing that? And this suggests that maybe that memory is not reliable that the emotion, emotional and surprising event is not going to lead to an accurate and vivid memory. It's still susceptible and vulnerable to distortion, which we know um, memory is. Another example, very similar example with the September 11th uh, attacks, 73% remember they saw the first plane on the day. Right, so, so when asked and surveyed, they do remember seeing that the, the video of the first plane flying into the towers on the day of the attacks. One big problem video wasn't available on the first day it was available afterwards right what they would have seen perhaps was the video of the second plane but they misremember it as being the first so here again we see more evidence challenging this idea that emotion is going to uh, increase this vivid memory uh, of hearing about this event other limitations of the theory there are differences uh, in culture and if I can figure out YouTube I'll try and put a link here where you can push a, a button and it will go to explaining how there are cultural differences uh, depending on your cultural values individualism and collectivism you might have different um, rates of forming flashbulb memories because of the amount of emotion experienced and the role of emotion and rehearsal there are also other biological factors these are possibilities right so um, we know that cortisol levels of cortisol are going to affect uh, the formation of memory cortisol is a stress hormone it's released in high um, in, in moments of high emotion but you could also argue maybe that supports uh, the original claim about the um, neurophysiology, that this is a, maybe one of the physiological factors they hypothesize that's going to uh, help with the formation of the flashbulb memory. But uh, individual differences in cortisol levels could uh, change the, um, yeah, the, f the formation of FBMs. Now, so there we have the, um, that's the summary of flashbulb memory. How do you apply this in an exam? And remember the exam deal. So let's look at some possible exam questions that you might get um, explain how emotion affects one cognitive process this would be a, for IB psychology students there'd be a short answer question or an essay question could be discuss the effect of emotion on cognition or evaluate one theory now regardless of how uh, all these three questions could be answered by looking at flashbulb memory let's just choose one let's just look at this one discuss the effect of emotion on cognition so what you need to do first is um, have a central argument explain the effect of emotion on cognition and you're going to use that with flashbulb memory theory and so remember to describe the theory in detail have a clear definition and including the what is in, uh, what is part of the flashbulb memory right like the the place and the informant the emotion etc why they occur and then we get into the evidence right so we're gonna look at the studies and perhaps neurological evidence as well then if you were writing a short answer question on IB psych that would be enough right describe the theory and the evidence uh, but then if we're looking at essay, we go further, we could talk about applications. I think you could possibly leave out the application, the A in, in this answer. I think you'd, um, you've got more than enough to write about uh, with the studies. And um, so I don't think that one's key. Uh, but definitely if you're writing a discuss or an evaluation, you include the limitations. And so that includes the, the counter evidence that I just talked about um, and also the other factors like culture. Okay, so we're saying, yes, emotion can affect cognition, but maybe culture is a moderating variable of that. If you include all of those things in detail, you're looking at an awesome answer. Uh, if you want some more information, if um, if you want to read some more, uh, I suggest going over to our blog, subscribing to that. I've got a link in the uh, description. I'm also going to post a summary uh, of the studies that I mentioned in today's uh, video. And also, there's a post already up there about um, flashbulb memory theory, so you can read all of this there as well. Um, also students um, Facebook group we've got one for teachers as well again links in the comments um, and you can head over to our store so I hope that was helpful thanks for watching and uh, yeah any questions just pop them in the questions cheers